Welcome to Compass Online. My name is Jana Dukes and I am so excited that you decided to join us today. You know, one of the things that we've been really focusing on is witnessing to others and sharing the love of Christ with others. My husband is a perfect example of that. One day we were at the grocery store and the person behind us um, was about to buy groceries and he decided that he wanted to buy groceries for them. And after he did that, he just said, Jesus loves you. And I just thought that that was a great way to share the love of Christ with someone with no strings attached, but just to be able to be a loving witness of God's greatness. And so I hope that that encourages you to be able to do the same thing. But right now we're about to start worship. So I hope that you'll join us and praise God together.
are three things that are true about me that I want to let you in on. Number one, I have been bitten by the travel bug. My wife and I got the opportunity to go to Croatia last summer. And ever since, we spend our evenings planning what's the next place we want to go. Now, a vacation is very different for us than a family trip. We've got some of those lined up as well. Thing number two, I love science fiction. I've been spending a lot of time reading some really fun science fiction books lately, and it has really made my imagination spin on what is even possible. And thing number three is I was a science major, a chemistry major in college. I love the sciences. Good science proves the existence of God. Now, here's the thing. When I take all three of those things and the ample spare time I apparently have, well, the magic happens. Because down in my laboratory at Three Rivers, I've been hard at work, and I want to let you know I've done it. I have created a time machine that travels across time and space. And I've even been able to do it without using a flux capacitor. So that begs the question, where would you go if you could go anywhere in history? For me, the easy answer is I would love to go back to the time of Jesus to see what was happening, to experience the miracles firsthand in the Near Eastern culture in which he was located. But if I went beyond that answer, I would also tell you that I would love to go see some of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But here's the deal. Because we have a time machine and I've built it large enough to take you with me, we can do that. We're actually going to go do that right now. Come on, let's go. All right, let me go ahead and plug in the coordinates here. All right, are you ready? Here we go. That is jarring every time. But welcome to the Pyramids of Giza. This is the only wonder of the ancient world that is still standing. It took over 20 years to build and over 100,000 people to construct it. Take it in in all its glory. Isn't it amazing? Now, that was us just traveling across space. But the next jump we make is traveling across time and space. Come on with me. Are you ready? Because here we are at the Colossus of Rhodes. You know, scholars used to debate whether this was just a large statue that was on one particular end of a harbor or if it had one leg on two separate harbors. But because we're here now, we can clearly see that it was one leg on two separate harbors. Ships used to have to go underneath to be able to get in and out of this location. Amazing! But we need to keep going. Ready? Welcome to the Lighthouse of Alexandria. This wonder stood for almost 1,500 years. This lighthouse was said to be amazingly bright because the mirrors harnessed the power of the sun. It had three distinct shapes as it was built all the way up. But the most amazing part is the legends that came with it. Because apparently, this lighthouse was so bright that it could be seen 35 miles away. And it was so powerful that it could burn up an enemy ship. But looking around while I'm here now, I can clearly see no enemy ships were harmed in the making of this sermon. So let's go on to the last one. Ready? The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar II is said to have built this for his wife because she was homesick for the gardens of her homeland. Now, there was debate on whether these gardens, one, actually existed, and two, if they did, were they built along the walls of the property or was it a rooftop garden? But again, we're here now. We are peering around and we can clearly see that it was both. There was greenery on the sides and on the top. Take it all in. Gorgeous. It did exist and it is amazing being here. You know, there are seven wonders of the ancient world. But Einstein actually identified an eighth. You know Albert Einstein. Are you ready for the eighth wonder of the world? I know we didn't hit all seven, but you get the picture, right? 
Here we go. Ready? The eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. Okay, it, it's time to be honest with you. We weren't actually traveling across time and space. We're just standing in front of a green screen. It's the magic of cinema. I know you were really convinced we were so lifelike and realistic. But Einstein did say that compound interest was the eighth wonder of the world. It's something that just doesn't make sense. You know compound interest from planning for retirement. The goal is you start young, you put money aside, and then you just let it grow. And interest forms on the interest made, and as you go, you can end the day with a very large sum of money. I like to think of it as the opportunity to be kind of like Scrooge McDuck. If you don't know DuckTales, I can tell you're not a millennial like me. But Scrooge had this secret vault of money that he would jump into and dive and swim through. And I like to think one day I might have money like that. I'm not going to have money like that. But that's the thought of compound interest. Put money in and make a sacrifice now and reap a benefit as you go. Einstein also said, though, compound interest has an opposite side. Because if you don't understand compound interest, you're actually more apt to pay it. And I want to use that as a way to jump into what we're actually going to be talking about here today. Because we're not going to talk about compound interest, but we are going to talk about the things we do now and the payouts that it gives us in the future. From a spiritual end, the good and the bad that we do now has some serious implications for the time to come. It's just not the time here on this earth. So with that being said, I'm excited to jump in and dive in, not to a money pit, but to the topic of the judgment seat of Christ. So let's jump straight into a passage that talks about this judgment seat of Christ, of the good works that we do now potentially outliving us here on earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, you might already be thinking, this sounds a little bit off. Right? Just two verses before this, in verse 8, we see that Paul is saying to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we just heard even last week Jeff talking about how we can have life because of Jesus in heaven if we put our faith and trust in him. The great white throne judgment. Now you're telling me there's an additional judgment present? What in the world is going on here? Okay, let's take a moment and use what I hope will be a helpful way for us to think about it. And it's just simply a light switch versus a dimmer switch. You know, I moved into a new home a couple of years ago and we did a bunch of work in putting in can lights and we put in light switches with dimmer switches. And when I say we, I mean definitely not me. But when we're talking about the light switch, we're talking about our salvation. A light switch is either on or it's off. We have either put our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, or we haven't. There's no way, there's no other way about salvation that works. It is either something we have or something we don't. This is not what we're talking about today. What we are talking about today is the dimmer switch. The dimmer switch is going to be the things that we have done here on earth. And whether it's good or it's bad, the level at which the dimmer switch is set at the end of our life will be the level of brightness of our light bulbs for all of eternity. Isn't that wild to think about, right? The second judgment is all about this dimmer switch. What Paul is saying is that the things that we do here on earth matter. And not only do they matter, they matter for all of eternity. Did that just blow your mind even a little bit? 
Because if you're anything like me, you're thinking, I have been told for years that when I die, I can't take anything with me. And what I'll tell you now is that's mostly true. The muscle car that you have sitting in your garage, that's not going to make the drive to the other side. My son's Pokemon card collection, that ain't going anywhere. Or maybe the gold, the jewelry, the silver, the money, the finances that you accumulate here in this life, they don't take the trek with you either. Those things aren't built to last. But what Paul is saying is that there are things that are built to last. The things that really matter. He actually talks about it in a different letter to the church in Corinth. See, we're spending our time in the second letter, but in the first letter, Paul writes this in chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stone, wood, hay, it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, that might not make a ton of sense, but I think we can make it make sense. Paul is saying the light switch is still on. At the end of the day, we still might have money even if we didn't long-term invest. But the dimmer switch, the light bulb just might not be as bright as it could be. The rewards that we receive might not be what we think they could be. You know, if we're honest, we really want the best. But then we're looking at good and bad are both going to be judged equally. You know, this judgment, this judgment seat of Christ, this second judgment also has another term that was historically used. And it's called the Bema Seat Judgment. See, back in Paul's day, a Bema Seat would have been very known. Think of this as like a very large raised platform, maybe in the center of the city, but most likely near where a magistrate, a governor, somebody of high importance in society would be able to go to see out across what was happening, to address the people that were present, to make grand proclamations. But another thing that this Bema seat location would have been used for would have been to enforce rules and to give rewards for athletic events. Think of it like the Olympics. The judge would be seated on the Bema seat to be able to see everything, to know what was happening, and then to use that seat to reward the victors. That's kind of a fun way to look through of all of this. Now, maybe let's go away from the old analogies that would have made sense in Paul's day and use something that might make sense for the sports fans among us. This judgment would be like the challenge flag being thrown in an NFL game. You might know the challenge flag, but ultimately what happens here is a play happens and a referee makes a decision on the spot of whether there was a penalty or where the ball should be placed. Was it a catch? I still don't know fully that rule. Was a touchdown scored? Now, if a coach doesn't agree with the determination that a referee has made, he will throw a challenge flag. And at that point, the referee will go underneath a hood and will review a bunch of monitors of all of these different camera angles of the play that has just occurred. And then after accumulating all of this evidence, we'll come out and we'll make the final determination of what has happened. The play of our life, whether you like to think it or not, is under review. The great referee is looking at all angles of everything we have done from the beginning of our lives to this moment. And from this moment all the way until the end of our lives. And we'll come out from under the hood and make the determination of where our dimmer switch has been set. So this hopefully is begging the question, how in the world can we do more good than bad? 
If we're thinking of our works like a measuring scale, how can we load up the good side to outweigh the bad side? How can we have our works matter and be built on a foundation that lasts? Now, I want to do this after I read a verse because I think the simplest answer is found one verse before what we've just spent our time focusing on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, says, We make it our aim to be pleasing to God. We can try to load up the good side of the scale with our works by living a life pleasing to God. But before we dive in, one huge caveat at the very beginning here is that it is impossible, impossible to please God without the work of Jesus Christ. Period. End of story. There is no enough good works to earn salvation. I want to take the few moments to talk about that again here, knowing we just talked about it last week because it is that important to realize that good works without Jesus, Scripture calls them filthy rags. Things that get used and tossed away. They are not the things that last. These good things only matter if we have the true foundation and backing behind them. And that is Jesus. So how can we please God knowing that Jesus and what he has done for us is the ultimate backdrop for all of it? Well, I want to start by saying some of it is just going to be personal. Here's what I mean by that. There are going to be times in my life where God has laid it on my heart to do something. Whether that something is making a meal for a mother who has just had a baby. He might not be asking you to do that same thing for the same person, but he's clearly put a burden on my heart to do that. That could be an example of something that I have been asked to do that will be looked at when my life is under review. For you, maybe you really feel like God has put it on your heart to save up, to send your kid to a private school or to pay for their college education. He might not have asked me to do that exact thing, but you feel a burden that comes from nowhere else except prayer and the sense that God is nudging you in that direction. Doing those things are pleasing to God. When he asks us to do something, we should do it. When he asks us to avoid something, we should do that as well. So those are the unique experiences. But I do think there are things that we can learn in scripture that are the more complete experience. There are things that all of us have been asked to do that are pleasing to God. And I want to use an acronym to help us remember it. And this acronym is actually found based in one of the things that are pleasing to God. You see, in Genesis chapter 8, we're just learning about Noah and the story of the flood and how after the flood waters recede, Noah steps out of the boat and he builds an altar and he sacrifices some of the clean animals that were on board his ship. And as he is doing that, we see the words that the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Sense of smell can be pleasing to God. So because of that, I want to remember to waft. W-A-F-T. There are many more than four things in scripture that are pleasing to God, but these are four big ones that we can do time and time again to try to live a life pleasing to what God has asked us to do. Picture that you are making your best Italian dish and you've added all the garlic in the world because a good Italian dish needs all of the garlic in the world. And as you're cooking it, the smell starts to fill the home. But instead of just letting that smell be the one that lingers, you go, you put your nose up close and you start to just do the motion like this. Let's bring the fragrance in and remember to waft. So that means we should dive in. What does the W stand for? Well, the W in this case means our words. Paul wrote the letter that we're studying about that he wrote to the church in Corinth. 
he wrote many other letters to local churches existing at his time as well. One of them was the church in Thessalonica. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, So we speak not to please people, but rather God. The words that we say matter. They matter here and they matter for all time. You know, James actually tells us in the New Testament as well that our tongue is like the smallest part of our body, but the hardest one to control. He actually compares it to our tongue is like the rudder of a ship, a very small thing, but it directs where everything else and every other life on board goes. Our words have that much power. You know, I, I want to confess to you that I remember a time very early on in our marriage, almost 15 years ago at this point, where I used my words not for the good side of the ledger, but for the bad side of the ledger. I can remember the car I was driving. I can remember that I was in front of the Taco Bell on Aurora Avenue in between Naperville and Aurora. Like It stands out this much. And it stands out because I was suffering from what we'll call a little bit of road rage. And when I say road rage, I mean somebody cut me off and I laid on the horn and I started screaming in my car like a madman because clearly that was going to fix the situation. And my wife, patient, kind, loving, was embarrassed for me. She was humiliated to be in the same car as me. So she honestly, lovingly, corrected me. She talked about how what I was doing wasn't fixing anything, it wasn't appropriate, and it wasn't going to build anything up. So I did what I thought was necessary in the moment. I took a perceived weakness of hers and I put words to it to intentionally tear her down. It's the only time in the course of my 15-year marriage where I intentionally remember trying to use words as a way to harm my wife. What I really did was used words to prove how much of a fool that I really am. Our words can be used to build others up in love or to tear them down. You know, there's a famous author named Gary Chapman, and he's most known for writing this book called The Five Love Languages. And in, he, in it, he says that there are words of affirmation, that some people feel the most loved when the words that we say are used to value them, to encourage them, to love them, to build them up. So we should use our words very carefully and in a way to do those things. So we can use our words to encourage a coworker who has been struggling recently. What's something good you've noticed them do? We can use our words to love on a wayward child who is doing things that we don't agree with scripturally, but we can still find ways to build them up, to confess our love for them, to truthfully look at them and say that there is nothing they could do to make us love them less. We can continue to make long-term deposits by speaking highly of our spouses. Or maybe more challenging, we can use our words to build up our spouses with others even when our spouse isn't present. That might strike a chord with some of you as well. When's the last time you've been with a group of friends and they've been talking poorly about their loved one, about the negative things that are happening, and you've decided you weren't going to join in? That instead of adding on, you were actually going to take the conversation in a different direction to speak about how much you love this other person. We can also use our words to speak appropriately and affectionately about God. Picture the Lord's Prayer. Jesus, when he teaches us how to pray, starts it by saying, God, your ways are so much higher and so much greater than mine ever could be. Your name is holy, set apart, good. Jesus models for how we can speak about the attributes of God in a way that help stir our emotions and help sink them into our hearts. 
So that's enough about the W. Our words matter, but it's not only our words that matter. Our actions matter as well. You know, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13, there's this section that I like to think just tells us all of these ways that we can appropriately worship. And mixed in with all of that, in chapter 13, verse 16, it says, don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. I don't know about you, but I love it when scripture tells us things that we teach to our first graders. You want to know how you can please God? By doing good things and by sharing the things that you have with others. This is a narrative that plays out through all of scripture. When you look at the people that God calls us to care about, they very frequently fall into four camps. The poor, those who have less than us. The widow, those who have lost here on earth. The orphan, those who are fatherless, they need to experience a taste of what a good father is like, like our father in heaven. And the immigrant, God doesn't care how they came into our midst, but that we are caring for them in our midst. We have been called to share. It's this topic of stewardship. That's what this whole second judgment is even all about. God will ask us, what have you done with my son? That's what we talked about last week. But what have you done with my stuff? What are the good things and the bad things you've done with the things that I have given to you? That's another thing that God cares about. We are going to be asked, what are we doing? You know, I remember a story of a family who fell on some hard financial times. They had bills come due, appliances were breaking, Christmas was right around the corner, and they faced a difficult situation to the tune of $1,200. $1,200 of unexpected finances that they didn't have the ability to cover. So they took time to pray. What, me- what ended up happening at that point in time? $1,200 showed up on their doorstep. Actions of people that they never even found out who it was met a real tangible need. Our actions matter and they can matter for all time. Now let's move on to the F. Our faith should matter as well. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Now without faith, it is impossible to please God. Verse 1 of that same chapter actually talks about that faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the proof of what isn't seen. All of that to say, faith is absolutely essential to pleasing God. Faith is a good thing that will be looked at when we get to this second judgment. You know, I love pulling the topic of faith out of Hebrews 11 because it's known as the Faith Hall of Fame. We see time and time again, people of the Old Testament are called out. Abraham, Moses, Rahab, people that had faith in the God of the Old Testament, the God of Scripture. Not perfect people, not people without sin, actually people with some really big and large baggage associated with them. But they still were able to please God because of their faith. So much so that their faith was accredited to them as righteousness. So where's your faith? Do you feel like your faith is growing? Do you feel like it's stagnant? Do you feel like you have faith at all? As much as anything, this might actually be the starting point for you. Spend some time in reading scripture. Spend some time in prayer. Be processing and praying through, God, increase my faith. Let me be hopelessly reliant on you because of the work of Jesus. And finally, the T. Our thoughts can also be pleasing to God. We see this in the words of David in the book of Psalms. Chapter 19, verse 14, David writes, Let the words of my heart, again, let my words and my thoughts be pleasing to you, Lord because you are my mighty rock and my protector. Not only does David here say that our words matter, but he says that our thoughts 
can also please God. You know, I think back to growing up, and it might not look like it now, but when I was high school, Jake, I loved punk rock music. I played in a punk rock cover band, but my dad was adamant. He had this saying of garbage in, garbage out. What he meant was the things that we are filling our mind with matter. The things that come in also go out. You know, we see that in the words of Philippians. We're told about to think about things that are true, upright, noble, just, righteous, all of those things. But when it came to this garbage in, garbage out scenario, he went so far as to say, I am going to review the lyrics of every song you want to sing, and I will be the final determination of whether you are allowed to sing it. At the time, I hated this rule. But that's the beauty of hindsight as well. My dad knew that what goes into my mind matters because my thoughts should be pleasing to the Lord. My thoughts should be on him and his people. We should have our thought life filled with loving God and loving others. We need to continually know that we should be wafting as a way to please God. But as we're getting ready to wrap out, I hope you're having the same thought that I am. That this sounds like the most selfish and self-serving message that you have maybe ever heard. And I want to tell you that I agree if our motives are in the wrong place. At the end of the day, our motives matter. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about this with things like our prayer life. He's saying, don't go out in public, beat your breast, and pray in a way that other people are going to look at you and be like, they're a good person. They're a spiritual person. I want to be like that person. Instead, he's telling us, no, do these things in secret to where our God in heaven knows, and you'll get rewards because of that. We should be focused on loving God and loving others. That is our primary motivation. Not getting the good things that are to come, those things will play out. We want to live a life pleasing to God, but we want to do it because we love God and we love his people. So let me close by talking about this. These rewards that we've been talking about that we receive in heaven are also called crowns. There are like five different crowns that we see in the New Testament that different people are given based on the things that they do here on earth. And we already talked about this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And I want to go back to there because in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, it says that one of the types of crowns that we are given are if we lead people to a saving faith in Jesus. Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit do that work We're like leading the horse to water, but we can't make the horse drink. But if that person decides to put their faith in Jesus, the way I'm reading this says that we can get a reward for that. So let's think about it maybe slightly different. Some of the greatest good that we can do, the best rewards that we can receive in heaven are one that we will get to spend eternity with Jesus. That is truly the greatest reward imaginable. But a secondary reward, one of these things that God gives us because he's good and loving, even though he doesn't have to give it to us, is the reward of having loved ones spending eternity with Jesus as well. Family will look different, but the hope is that we have such a faith that we will work and strive to populate heaven not for our own good, not to show how amazing we are, but so that our lives can be seen as being pleasing to God. So at the end of this life, when the challenge flag is thrown and the great referee goes to the monitor and shows you all of the good and the bad, my hope and prayer is that we have strived to love God and his people, that we have looked to use our words and our action our faith, and our thoughts to fall more in love with Jesus and to lead more people to love Jesus. So would you pray with me to that end? God, thank you for the opportunity to be pleasing to you, that we know it's not possible without Jesus. 
But God, as you put things in our hearts and in our lives, may we obedient to what you have called us to do. May the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts, may our faith, may our actions, may it all be a life that is compiled to be pleasing to you. And the rewards that you graciously decide to give, God, we just want to take a moment even now to say thank you for whatever that will be because we trust you as a good and gracious and loving God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
living sacrifice all my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life for Jesus Christ Hey, thank you so much for joining us. It is our mission at the Compass Church to help people find and follow Christ. And we're able to do that because of your giving. We would love to know that you decided to join us. Can you fill out that connection card so that we can be able to know that you are here listening to this message? We are so grateful for you. And I want to invite you to come back next week because we have more to learn. Hope to see you then.